So you don't plant a vegetable garden to save money. You just don't. So why do you do it? Well, because it's fresher. Well, I mean, the local stuff at the farmer's market is really very fine, and they're trying to make a living, so maybe we should not compete with them by harvesting our own bumper crop of failed tomatoes. <laughs> Ultimately, I answered this question this way. I grew, I've planted vegetables to watch them grow. I hope to eat some, but I was not planning on investing a lot of time hoeing and weeding and watering. I just don't know how, and I wasn't that invested in it. And then I realized I did it truly, because I'd never seen them grow before. I mean, I've had a tomato plant on my porch, but I wanted to see it actually go on. So we had tomato plants and green beans and uh, uh, snap peas and a pumpkin and a zucchini, which grew like crazy and produced absolutely nothing. <laughs> I have, hey, but it was so much fun to watch them grow. It was fun in the sense that I was saying, it is miraculous to behold. You put a little thing in the ground. I mean, a little pumpkin seed, and this thing from another planet comes out of the ground. And it goes all over the place and has these big, beautiful orange blossoms. I learned that, try as you want, the animals are out 24 hours a day. And they're going to eat it anyway. And what's more, the water will come when it comes, and it always comes too little or too much. And when I got used to the idea that I couldn't really win nature, that arm wrestling match is stacked from the outset, that I should just sit back and relax. And I actually ate some of my really, truly great tomatoes, and they were very good. And we ate some green beans, and they were tasty. We ate some peas, they were fun, and I do have a pumpkin that has escaped squirrel death so far. And I have the possibility of asparagus in a couple of years, and a couple of old, tired green onions that I should plant. And what I came away with is the marvel of all this life happening around me, watching it happen, taking it in, and yes, sharing it with the squirrels, and the bees, and the ants and the blight, because they all live. I felt like the whole world was right there in front of me, and all I had was a front row seat, and I got to eat along with it. It's like going to the movies and getting free popcorn. It was marvelous. The reason I'm telling you this story is because I'm telling you this week about growing your soul. Last week I talked about freeing your mind and how that was one of three things liberal religion is committed to, three the threefold mission of liberal religion is to free minds, grow souls, and change the world. And I talked about freeing the mind last week because it's the one we all think about because most of us have that struggle sometime in our lives. But I emphasized last week and reiterate today that we need all three. If all you do is free your mind and it doesn't change you, you're just thinking, you're just an ivory tower ponderer writing on blackboards. And if you grow your soul in the sense of feel deeply toward others but don't know what you're feeling about, your brain is still in a, in, a, in, a, in a channel, then you're no good to anyone. And if you run out and try to change the world and don't know why and don't know how, you're just chaotic. We need all three. And I want to emphasize that right now because I want to talk about growing the soul. And this one really is the one where I sort old liberals from new liberals. New liberals get this right away. They like soul. They like soulful things. They like soul music. They like all that kind of stuff. Older people, and I'm right on the edge. People older than me, let me say. My age and older think, what do you mean by soul, Sonny? They're worried I'm going to think that you have something in your brain kind of way inside your pituitary that when you die sneaks out your nostrils or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about something religious in a doctrinal sense. When I talk about growing your soul, I'm talking about your wholeness as a person, your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, your commitments, the integrity of your whole being. Because if you do nothing but think and do not feel, you're not a whole person. And if you feel and do not think, you're not a whole person. And if you act without either doing either one, you're just a menace. So growing the soul is becoming fully present. And that's why I want to give you a story from Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer was a, a theologian first. He wrote a book that set everybody back on their ear called The Quest for the Historical Jesus, in which he pronounced, you can't find him. He's not there. 
But he decided that was an ivory tower world and he wanted to make a difference. So he took himself out of theology where he was a professor and retrained himself as a physician to work in Africa. And one of the things he said, and I'm looking for my reading here because I didn't read it at the outset, is that uh, I was at last in a position to acquire the knowledge I needed in order to feel the firm ground of reality under my feet. You know what he means, right? You do all this ivory tower stuff, you want to feel some facts, get some empirical stuff, some numbers, some stuff you can touch and measure. But then he says, but the study of natural sciences brought me even more than the increase of knowledge I longed for. It was, for me, a spiritual experience. What? How can science and spirituality, how can science make you more spiritual? Well, he goes on. He says, I'm looking for the text here, that, ah, uh -huh, there it is. I thought I had it with me. I obviously do not. I'll have to paraphrase it for you. Oops, there it is. Too many pieces of paper, cluttered mind. The knowledge that results from a single manifestation of being, the natural, remains incomplete and unsatisfying so far as it is unable to give the final answer to the great question of what we are in the universe for and for what purpose we exist. The nature of the living being outside me, I can only understand by living understanding the living being within me. Do you see what he's saying? That when you encounter the world of scientific fact, be it astronomical or astrophysical or biological or geological, it begs the question of why and wherefore. What's the point? What's the purpose? What does it mean? And the, that should make you think the same question. What am I here for? What am I here to do? What is my purpose? So the question calls to the question. Abyssos vocat abyssum. It says in the, in, in the Psalms, deep calls unto deep. The deep questions of nature should call forth the deep, nation, the deep questions of our own personal nature. Why am I here? What am I doing? That's what growing the soul is about. And it, if it happens only here in the 20 minutes I squeeze in at the end of this hour and lap over into this noon hour, if you only do it now, you're missing most of your opportunity to grow your soul. A woman named Starhawk, who was a proponent of earth-based religion said, this world, this world, is the terrain of the spirit, and this world becomes the realm in which the sacred must be honored. When we look over there, beyond this world, for spirituality, for getting it, it's right here in front of us, in the garden, in the ants, in the blight, in the trash, in our daily world. We end up with a passive ivory tower spirituality, and that's not what I'm here to promote. I'm here to say that we cannot grow spiritually if we are disconnected from the world by thinking it's way over there in some holy place or that the world here is not a spiritual place, that it's merely material to, to plant. If you think your vegetable garden is only to feed you food, you're missing most of its value. We cannot grow spiritually when we are disconnected from the, from the world by ignorance or isolation. No matter how comfortable it can be, and it can be quite comfortable. We know plenty of people are quite comfortable in this world, not knowing many things, and not worrying about very much. It's a good place to be if you want to be content. And we're all tempted by it. Everyone in this room, myself included, we all want to be content and comfortable. Which is why, friends, it's so hard to grow large liberal churches because very few people get up in the morning and say, oh, I think I'll go to church and let someone whack on me a little bit about how much I don't know. I think I'll get up and be challenged by all that I think is so. Nobody goes out for a beating like that. You just don't. But that's what liberal religion does when it is honest. It causes discontent in your heart. It causes dissonance in your mind. It causes discomfort in your body because it asks elephantine questions.